Well, I often when when we're doing these podcasts, I will I will bring in uh, something that uh, has meaning uh, in my in my life and reminds me of God's grace. And we were cleaning out a storage room uh, in our building that we have, uh, mainly because it flooded. Was the bad news? And I came across this book. It's a it was my memory book from the Lutheran school that I attended. My parents enrolled us in that school when I was in fourth grade. And I was, my teachers were wonderful, godly men who just loved children. I I, I don't know where I'd be without mm. the influence of these men in my life. Uh, they taught me to love the Lord and to love scripture and it's my first exposure to loving theology as they led us to memorize uh, portions of Luther's small catechism which is a really sweet catechism and the the memory book is is arranged in chapters memory chapters and each one would have a portion of the catechism uh, passages from God's Word and hymns that went with those, both of those. And uh, for me, it was like just finding an absolute treasure. And it reminded me of how God's grace was operating to rescue and transform me before I had any sense of what those words meant. It's just such a beautiful thing. that God was capturing my heart and shaping my heart to love him and to love his word and to love the doctrines of the word of God uh, as a little boy. It's just such a such an amazing thing. And I, I, I hold this book and I think, why me? It's just a miracle of God's love and his God's goodness that out of the mass of humanity, this is, this is my heritage. I could have never earned it, achieved it, deserved it, but by God's grace, I was part of His redeeming plan. It's such a such a beautiful thing, and um, it makes me again recommit myself to something that I've we've talked about on this podcast. That I I want to be better at counting my blessings than numbering my complaints, and that is not always easy for me. Uh, and this is one of those reminders of just incredible blessings that God has planted in my life that began to shape me long before I knew I was being shaped. Uh, so look for those blessings in your life, and uh, thank you, Lord, that even on your stupidest day, He's still working. Still loving you, never as disgusted, uh, and that's a that's a beautiful thing. Well, I'm excited about today because I have in my presence Nancy Guthrie. Uh, I've known Nancy for a long time and have watched the development of her ministry. Nancy is a wonderful Bible teacher. She has this this God-given ability to make Scripture live in ways that often it doesn't live for us, uh, to connect uh, Scripture to our everyday lives, uh, to convince us that the Bible is actually the story of Jesus. And so I'm, I'm enthused about the conversation we're, we're going to have, and I'm sure as you watch or listen to this, you will be enthused as well. So thank you for being willing to do this, Nancy. No, oh, thank you, Paul, for having me. So I, I want to uh, have you walk through a little bit of your story because I think it'll be uh, very helpful and encouraging to people out there who uh, are facing some of the harsh realities of life in a fallen world. So let's start with your uh how you met your husband, 
and what you first thought of him because I think that that story is fun <laughs> and then we'll move because I wrote from there. about it in my book yeah <laughs> thank thankfully he was willing to let me do that that's right <laughs> no, I did ask his permission by the way before I said that yes so I got a job right out of college at word publishing in Waco Texas a Christian book and music company that was and, a big deal in those days oh man it was a big deal yeah and uh I'd been there for about a year and a half when David, who became my husband, moved from Portland, Oregon to Waco, Texas, which was a big move for him. And um, we met around the halls. We were in, I, I guess, you know, you could say it was an office romance, although uh, we really met outside of that. But uh, yeah, so we met and a, and a year from the day we met, we got married and uh I am certain we've so we've been married 36 years now and I'm grateful for him. So he didn't impress you in the beginning. <clears throat> well, you're going to make me say it, aren't you? Yes. All right. So <laughs> Well, yeah. you have the permission, so <laughs> yeah. we might as well go we there. We might as well go there. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, he had moved from Oregon. He wore a lot of brown, Paul, and <laughs> he he had this really heavy beard and I don't know, he just didn't smile very much when I saw him around the halls. Um and then uh, I was in the choir at my church, and our choir was going to be performing a premiere of a word musical. And so he came to talk to our choir, and he got up in front of the choir, and I was just, wow. I mean, he was just such a natural up in front. You know, he was witty. He was at ease, and it just really caught my attention. And... Then I kind of watched him when he left, went out to the parking lot, and he got into this red two-seater convertible sports car. And I was like, I have seriously underestimated this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he still drives a cool car. So, yeah. <laughs> so how long before you got married? One year. And then walk us walk Yeah. Us forward. So uh, that was in Waco, Texas. We moved to Dallas for five years. And then... I was no longer working for Word Publishing. I had, had a son. We had a son named Matt uh, in 1990. And then we moved to Nashville, which was a great move for us. We loved that. We're still there. Mm. And I'm not going anywhere else. <laughs> um, <clears throat> then in 1998, I gave birth to a daughter named Hope. And when Hope was born... Uh, it was immediately obvious maybe there were some problems. She was born with club feet, and the OBGYN said, you know, don't worry about that because we can put casts on her feet right away and take care of that. But David had noticed kind of a look between the nurse and the doctor, and the doctor did say, you know, you're, go you're going to want to have the pediatrician take a good look at her when he gets here. And so he came into my hospital room that night, and he had this little piece of paper on which he had made a list of what he called a number of little things that weren't quite right. So besides the club feet, uh, she had a really large soft spot and some extra skin on her neck. And um, her hands turned slightly out. She had what's called a simian crease. If you look at your hand, you don't have a straight line across yeah. your hand, you know. Um, and so the next day, a geneticist from Vanderbilt Hospital came and examined her, and he came to our room, and he told us he suspected she had a rare metabolic disorder called Zellweger syndrome, which we had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And he explained that she was missing a subcellular particle that you and I have in every cell of our bodies. And this, these peroxisomes have a job. Their job is to rid our cells of toxins, mm. in particular long-chain fatty acids. And he said, because she's missing those, basically there's nobody to take out the trash mm. in her cells. And because of that, a lot of damage has already been done to all of her major organs, especially her liver and her kidneys and her brain. He told us that uh, there was no treatment and no cure, and that most children with that syndrome live less than six months. So uh, explain what it's like to get that kind of news. As, yeah. Well, it was How devastating. Uh, uh, good question. I was probably about 35. Yeah. Um, Paul, I, had, I was looking forward to having a daughter. Yeah. 
a daughter who would talk like with her hands like me and <laughs> and would be my friend in my yeah. old age. And I had plans for her. Mm. And so it was a process of accepting the reality that we were going to take her home with us from the hospital, but we weren't going to take her home to raise her and for her to be our friend in our old age. But we were actually going to take her home to usher her toward death pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And your thought about where is God in all of this? And mm. yeah. You know, you were talking about your memory book and not knowing that the Lord was preparing you for what you do now. And I look back and I see some beautiful ways the Lord was preparing me for this. At that point in my life, I had a media relations business. So I worked on publicity for a lot of uh, books by Christian authors. And I had spent the year before that working on a book all about God's sovereignty. <laughs> and even more than that, uh, I, I was in Bible study fellowship at the time. And in, in BSF, when you study the book of Genesis, you spend either a week or two on the book of Job. And I, I know I had read Job before, but it just impacted me so much differently that time through, I was so struck by Job's immediate response to incredible loss. Mm. Because as we read Job, you know, he, he loses his house and he loses all of his livelihood and he loses 10 of his children. And But we immediately read there in Job 121 that he tore his robe and he shaved his head. So he's very open about his grief. And he bowed to the ground and worshiped. And two weeks before Hope was born, I just remember saying to my small group, I would like to think maybe I might do something like that if when the worst thing happens to me. But I don't know that I would. But, mm. but that would be my aim mm. and my desire, that I would be able to respond to loss that way. And... Um, I remember that week, we spent a week there in the hospital with Hope being run through a bunch of tests to confirm that diagnosis. And I just remember thinking, waking up that morning after getting it and just thinking, well, I guess this is my chance. Hmm. I guess I am about to find out how I will respond when the worst thing that I can imagine happens to me. And so... I guess, I mean, that was 24 years ago, and I guess I've been finding out. <laughs> <laughs> so. And, you know, I don't have a perfect record in that regard. There's only one person who has ever suffered in perfect faithfulness. Yep. And it's not me. Yeah, that's right. Right. Um, but I can see how he prepared me for it by knowing his word. This is why I'm <laughs> such an advocate for men and women, but in my case in particular, women, knowing theology. Mm. I, I think so many people think, oh, you know, yeah, maybe you Bible teachers or, you know, you you really serious Christians, like you might need to get theology. No, we all need theology. We, we all need it if we are going to endure in this life loving and trusting Jesus. Okay, let, let's let's go there because... Uh, between the already of our conversion and not yet our home going, God has chosen that our address would be this world, that it itself is groaning, mm -hmm. waiting for redemption. So uh, suffering is a universal human experience. If you're not suffering now, you will someday, or you're near somebody who is. So how does the theology of the Word of God help us because it's all of our experience Every, uh my boss at ccf john bettler said if if someone could hand you a bag and it was their story you think everybody's story is better than yours you would open up their bag and you would say oh i don't want your story because in there <laughs> exactly. 
are things that none of us none of us want to face. We all we all face the unwanted, the unexpected, the unplanned. Uh, suffering does enter our doors. So, how has God designed His Word to help us? Yeah, for, with that. Well, I think of you know how when there's a terrible like a hurricane or storm, and you see those weathermen, and they're out there like maybe they're holding on to a stop sign, yes. <laughs> and you think go inside, but um, you know they're they're holding on to something that has been plunged into the ground. Yeah to provide some security and stability when the storm hits. Mm. So I can think of several important truths I took hold of um, that kept me in the midst of the storm. Uh, The first one is God loves me. Mm. (laughs) It's very simple, but I think it's something many of us question uh, because, you know, we just think it through. Like, okay, God, I believe you're in charge and you control this world. And so how, why is it you would have uh, arranged circumstances of my life that would bring me this much pain? And, and we interpret that as that he doesn't love us. Mm-hmm. And I would say, if you, if, you, if, if you want to see if God loves you, it's not your circumstances you look at. You look to the cross. Yeah. And this is where we see that God loves us. So, but you have to be convinced of that. Yeah, I, God I, really does love me. I, you know, it, it really is true that two of the questions that every human being carries with them uh, is, "Will somebody love me?" Hmm. That's all of us. The second question is even scarier. Once people know me, will they still love me? Hmm. And those are both answered at the cross. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's magnificent, and uh, I, I think what we do things in reverse. So we let our circumstances shape what we believe about God, instead of letting Scripture shape yes. what we what we believe, and then that becomes the tool by which we interpret our yeah. our circumstances. And the thing is, like, if if the only thing I have all to hold on to is that God loves me, I, I need another thing. I need to know God is in control of everything. Mm-hmm. Because if I just have He loves He loves me and He doesn't have control over everything, that He can might love me, but He can't order this world to to lead toward any. Ends right, yeah, my, and if he just has power, but he does, I'm not convinced he loves me. Then I don't know how he's going to use that power in my life. Yeah, one of the things that I, I find myself saying is, the promises God makes to us are only as reliable as the extent of his sovereignty, because Absolutely. he can he can only guarantee uh, the delivery of those promises over situations he has control. Right. I mean, I can guarantee things in in my loft in my building because I own it, but mm-hmm. next door I can't because I have no sovereignty there. And uh, people who struggle with this th- doctrine of the sovereignty of God, I just say, it's the most encouraging thing to me. I think all the time, but like no one who's suffering ever wants anyone to quote at them Romans 8, 28. Yeah. Right? Because... What that does, what it feels like when somebody quotes it at you is that they are diminishing your suffering. Like, this shouldn't really hurt so much or this shouldn't be so hard because, you know, God's going to use it for good. Um, but I would also say in the midst of suffering. I like your voice when do you, you like said that? that. Okay. Yeah. In the midst of suffering. Oh, my goodness. Aren't we so grateful to know to have that verse hmm. and to know that is true? That in everything, all things, we can be confident that that God is working for our good. And I also appreciate what comes in the next verse, which so often is not included in that. I, so often we just hear Romans uh, eight twenty eight, which is you know that in everything He's going to cause it to work for good. And I think that can often leave people then going, okay, well. I've got to look around and I've got to find something mm. that I deem 
to be good enough to be able to make a direct connection and say, God has done this to accomplish this good. And that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Actually, in the next verse, it tells us exactly what the good is Mm, that God intends to accomplish, which is he intends to conform us to the image of his son. And uh, The good is his redemptive purpose. In our lives. In our lives. And see, so yeah, oftentimes I think people are looking for something out there uh, that they can say, okay, that good thing, that that was enough to make my suffering worth it. Although some people never find that, of course. But I think what those verses do, it causes us to look in here. Say, God, what what are you trying to do in me? How, in what way are you refining me and refining my understanding of who you are and what is good and true and valuable in this world? And when we do that, we come to certainly a better sense of the way, one of the ways in which he intends to use the suffering that he allows into our lives. Hmm. So what what often happens in these moments, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with my brother Ted about this. He was a pastor for 35 years. The, the church, body of Christ, rises to the crisis moment, but then that sort of melts away, and then there you are, you're, you haven't quit grieving, you're dealing with this massive, life-changing thing this hole in your life that i mean as you tell your story i just think it's unthinkable we almost lost our daughter in an accident she was hit by a car and crushed against a wall and we just remember the trauma of going through that Mm -hmm. so i often say to people uh, in an experience like this some of your greatest comfort comes from people I mean, people have an amazing power to bring comfort to others. Mm-hmm. And and I would also say, in the midst of something like this, some of the deepest hurts come from people. Um, I, think, I think I went into this experience with a lot of high expectations for people and how they would respond to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I had a posture of kind of, okay, what are you going to say to us? What, you know? And um, and was pretty harsh and um, Hope was with us for six months and then she died. And I remember shortly before her death, talking to a mom who had lost a child and she said to us, she said, you know, the hard thing after our child died wasn't what people said. It was that some people didn't say anything at all. Hmm. And certainly David and I discovered that, which to me was an expression of uh, your daughter's life doesn't merit a mention. No. That, that's how it hit me, hmm. and, and that was hard. But I, I hate to jump immediately to the negative because there was so much positive. When I just think this is what this was what gets me crying, if you're trying to get me crying, is to talk about people who surrounded us and were just there for us in in so many ways. And, you know, I, I've learned a lot about that. And um, sometimes I'll I'll be counseling or talking with someone who's going through the loss of a loved one, and maybe they're feeling a little bit disappointed. So, so for many years, David and I, for fourteen years, we held weekend retreats for couples who've lost children. Hmm. And I would say to them at one point, "Okay, how many of you on on this side of loss?" feel like you have lost some friends and you have some friends or family who have really disappointed you, and most of them would raise their hands. And then I would say, now, how many of you had people show up in your life that had maybe never been a part of your life before? And through this, they've become an important part of your life. And they'd kind of be like, yeah, you know, like almost hadn't put those two things together. Mm. You know, I, I think of my friend Julie Dilworth, 
she's my friend now. We weren't really friends before I had Hope. And I remember her contacting me one point really early on. And she said, you know, I've got Mondays open. And I would just like to come over every Monday and get to know Hope and help you. And that was big to me, Paul. You know, I couldn't help but love Hope. Mm. This child was going to die. Mm. But it meant a lot that somebody else that I wasn't even that close with wanted to know her, you know. And so she came over every Monday and she did the laundry sometimes and I went for a walk or just whatever. Um, And I'll never forget uh, the Monday after Hope died getting a text from her. You know, it's Monday and I miss Hope. Hmm. And a week ago was uh, the 24th anniversary of Hope's death. And I woke up, text from Julie Dilworth. Hmm. I'm thinking about Hope today, you know, just that she has never forgotten. And she knows I'm going to wake up on that morning thinking about Hope. And almost before I do, I get a text from her, which is profoundly meaningful. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that it's important to point out that God... God does make his invisible grace visible by sending people of grace to give grace to people who need grace. That is such an important and precious thing. I mean, there's everybody can be that visible representation of God's grace in somebody else's life. Look around. You have people who need that right now in your life. They're there already who, who need that. Uh, I was thinking as you were talking when I was, my sickest couldn't get out of a chair. I was dealing with the irrationality that at the point of my greatest ministry influence, God had rendered me weaker than I'd ever been in before. And the person I least expected would just walk with me through that Mm -hmm. and just bring me hope in the gospel was a crazy Irish friend of mine who uh, he would, in my darkest moments, he would send me... uh, a video of a beautiful Irish choir singing a gorgeous mm-hmm. hymn, mm-hmm. and I just weep yeah. as I'm listening to the hymn over and over again. Um, but all of us have people in our life that that need that. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest challenges, Paul, was um, in terms of being a part of the body of Christ is what people's expectations were for us about what faith should look like mm. in that situation. I uh, I so remember being about two weeks in and the secretary from church called and she said, we've got you eyes on the prayer list and we're asking people to pray that God would heal hope. I just said, well, okay. That's not how we're praying. Um, you know, we we had this diagnosis. We knew that there was not one living person who had this disorder. And and what was hard is that we knew that people, when they hear, heard us talk in that way, that they deemed that to be lacking in faith. You know, that we didn't have enough faith that God could heal her. And the thing was, for us, it was never a question of does God have the power to heal her? He he spoke creation into being. This is not hard for him. Uh, what it was for us is that we knew that he had knit her together in the womb. And we sensed he had already determined that her life would be short. And and that what we determined, what faith meant for us, was trusting him with that, with trusting him that he, that her life had purpose and meaning and value, even though on the world's terms she would never contribute anything. And this um, experience for you had purpose and value. Absolutely. Yes, that it had significant purpose and value in us, that he was at work in us through this. And so, you know, I, re- I remember one time Paul just, I-, I was thinking, okay, you know, I finally like had a moment to breathe and I was rocking hope in the nursery we had prepared for her. 
And I was like gathering myself up to pray. And I had decided, okay, it's very generous of me to let God know I was okay, that she wasn't going to live to grow old. But I thought, okay, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to pray for. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to extend her life as long as possible. And I'm like gearing up to pray. And then I thought to myself, well, what if a longer life for her isn't better for her? Mm-hmm. Or maybe if it isn't better for me. So why, 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 why would I, in my limited capacity, presume to tell God what the best outcome for this is going to be? And instead, I just thought, okay, I, I think what faith looks like and what my prayer should sound like is is saying to God, I want to trust you with the length of life that you give her. And so that means what I want to ask you for is for the grace that I'm going to need for that to be enough for me. Mm. Mm. And the grace to trust you with the length and the quality of life that you give to her. That is so important. Um, That is such a different way of thinking about what faith looks in the midst of these dark valleys. Uh, Because you just hear that phrase all the time, I'm going to just trust God for a miracle. And that anything less than that doesn't appear to be trusting God. Uh, where is if God is perfectly holy in every way all the time, then everything ordains for me is good. And if he loves me and he is in control, then faith is resting in those things in the midst of this this circumstance. Mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, God in the perfection of his holiness and the perfection of his love has chosen for us to go through this experience. Mm. And it's impossible for God to not be good. Yes, yeah. I began to think, okay, I think the prayer here is, Lord, no matter what happens, uh, even if you don't provide the miracle, even if you take away what is most precious to me, I will still love you. Hmm. And I will still obey you. And I will continue to believe that you are good and that you are working things together for my good and for your glory. I think that's the prayer of faith. So th- that, that's your commitment. How hard was it to live that commitment? <laughs> hmm. Well, the Lord gave me grace for that. Hmm. I suppose he also put it to the test. Um, you know, to have a child with this syndrome meant that both both David and I are carriers of a recessive gene trait for that syndrome. And so that meant, after we had hope, we knew that whenever we have a child, that child would have a 25% chance of having the fatal syndrome. And so we had a difficult decision to make hmm. about whether or not we would have more children. And... You know, honestly, Paul, we didn't think that would be the worst thing in the world (laughs) because we loved and enjoyed hope. Mm. And um, so in some ways, that that didn't seem like the worst outcome um, to take that chance again. But also, our lives weren't just us. Uh, There was our son, Matt, who was eight when we had hope and who had spent six months living in a house waiting for his sibling to die. Mm. And then a lot of months after that in a house with a really sad mom, which I promise you couldn't have been very much fun. Hmm. And then on top of that, there was our parents. And I've come to 
think that as hard as it is to lose a child, in some ways it's doubly difficult for a parent to watch your child lose a child. You know, yes. parents, they, they, they want to be able to pull something out of their bag of tricks to fix things for their kids. And, you know, our parents couldn't do that. Yeah, and, it's a natural instinct of a parent to protect your children. Yeah. So it had been devastating for my parents and for David's parents. And so we decided to take surgical steps to prevent another pregnancy. Uh, and so you can imagine my shock a year and a half after Hope died to discover that I was pregnant. And I, I well remember that day. Uh, it was such a mixture of emotions, Paul. God I'm, is, in fact, sovereign. <laughs> he is sovereign over there. Like, there's this thing we have ruled out, and he has overruled it. Yeah. Right. Um, and, but our, our emotions were such a mixture. I mean, there was there was part of this, like this cautious hope. Like, here's this thing that we so wanted, mm. but had ruled out. And, and maybe God is going to give us another child, mm. a healthy child to raise and enjoy. But then there was this also gut-wrenching sense of fear. Maybe he's going to ask us to do that again. Mm -hmm. And honestly, Paul, you know, uh, when I think about those months after Hope's death um, and what the grief was like, I just, the best way I know, I've always known how to explain it, is that it felt like there was th like there was this heavy boulder on my chest, mm -hmm. and like I was always struggling to get my breath, and that it was just dark. It was dark, and I remember, you know, on that day when I figured out I was pregnant again, I remember looking out the window, and just feeling like like finally the sun is beginning to shine in my life again, and like but maybe there's some dark clouds that are gathering out there in the horizon that are getting ready to sweep into my life again. And I think, you know, for God, I was just like, so, you know, if we, we asked why in regard to hope, which we had, and <clears throat> at this point it was like, why again? Hmm. Um, that day I discovered I was pregnant, I called the geneticist who had diagnosed hope because he had told us, now don't take any permanent birth control steps because we can test very early. And we understood what he was saying there. But we called him that day and we said, you know, we we won't choose to terminate this pregnancy either way, but could we go through that testing? Because we'd really like to know which direction we're headed, especially before we share this with our parents and with our son and our broader community. And so... I went through prenatal testing. It took a long time, so it wasn't until I was about 15 weeks pregnant we got those results, and we found out that we were going to have a son this time and that he would also have the fatal syndrome. Hmm. So it was, it, was, uh, it was the same but different, if that makes sense in many ways. You know, with, with Hope, I hadn't known during the pregnancy. I was going to have a child who would live a short time, and so with our son Gabriel to go through that nine months of pregnancy knowing that he was going to die. You know, there, there were lots of awkward moments. We'd be out somewhere and we'd run into someone who knew about the death of our daughter, Hope, and they'd be so excited to see that I was pregnant. And they'd say, oh, this is so exciting. You know, and they'd say some, sometimes they go, oh, this is God blessing you for your faithfulness. And... We'd be standing there trying to decide, you know, if we were going to drop a bomb on <laughs> them, right. you know, uh, and, you know, and we, you know, we would often end up saying, um, yes, we're so excited to have another child. And this child is going to have the same centro hope had. So mm. he'll be with us just a short time. And that made for a lot of awkward conversations. Yeah, I guess. So how did you get from uh, this, this heavy weight of grief to deciding you wanted to speak in the lives of other grieving parents? Mm. Mm. Well, it's always the word, Paul. 
the word uh, shapes us, gives us direction. It really does. I was still in BSF at that time. I, I was, I think it was about March before Gabe was born in July. And that week <clears throat> was the, we were studying the parable of, what it's called in the Bible, parable of the talents is what many people call it. I think of it as the parable of resources. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a there's a master and he's leaving and he entrusts resources to his various servants. And he has one expectation that they will invest what they've been entrusted with for a return for his kingdom. Hmm. And, you know, having worked in the publishing industry a lot of years after Hope died, a lot of people had asked me, are you going to write a book? And honestly, Paul, at first I kind of thought, oh. I think I might. I feel like I've learned a lot. There are so many ways in which hope enriched our lives. But but that changed. I, I, I went from feeling so wise to, I've got a lot of questions. Hmm. And I went from feeling like I have a lot to say to, I'm not sure I have anything to say to anybody. And then on top of that, I... You know, having worked in the Christian publishing industry for about 15 years at that point, I realized I'd seen a lot of people have incredible experiences and then, in my view, exploit them hmm. somehow in a book. And I thought to myself, you know, why would I think I'm above that? They, they probably don't start out intending to do that. But at some point it becomes that. And I thought, if, if I wake up one day, and I discover that I'm exploiting what ha hopes life and death for something about myself. That would be so painful. Mm. I could not bear it. And so I just set those ideas aside. you know. So then I got pregnant with Gabriel. I'm sitting in Bible study that week. Hear the parable of talents. And I so clearly remember the teacher. She just looked at us and she said, what has God placed in your hands? There's the power of, an, of a carefully chosen uh, application question, oh, right? Absolutely. That's a good one. And I sat there and I just thought, well, I've I've had this experience in Christian publishing that I get publishing and books and how all that works and who's who. And I've I've got some love for I've got love for and some understanding of the scriptures. I, I've got some communication abilities. And then on top of that, God is giving me this experience that might make people willing to listen to what I have to say. Hmm. And so I went back home that day, and I, I pulled out of my files. To, during the last month of Hope's life, the women's ministry director at my church had asked me to just share what the Lord was teaching me dur during Hope's life. And I had shared lessons because I had gone back to the book of Job to try to figure some things out because I had been so stunned, not only by that verse that he he bowed and worshipped was his first response, but then the, the book of Job ends by saying— it, in the translation, I had read it in then. And Job died having lived a long, good life. And I had thought to myself, I don't know how you could describe this as a life good. Hmm. And at that point, I thought, I'm not sure my life will ever be good again. So I, I had studied the book of Job to try to figure that out. And so that day, after asking, what has God placed in your hands? I went home. I pulled those notes out. And I started writing what became my first book, a little book called Holding On to Hope. And um, and then people began asking me to speak, and you know they really wanted me to come and tell my sad story. And I realized I I I know that my story has some power to move, maybe even inspire. But I also know that there's only one story that makes dead people alive. Hmm. And so I've got to figure out how do I use my story to tell God's story the, that is centered in the person and work of Christ. And so I begin working on honing uh, the opportunities that God presented to me to present Christ. So how long did you do those weekends and are you still doing that? Ah, we just stopped this this last year. We did them for 14 years. We mm -hmm. had 44 respite retreats uh, wow. for couples who have lost children. So we spent the weekend with over a thousand grieving parents over those years, which was the greatest privilege of our lives. Mm -hmm. Really was.
Um, but o- over the last five years ago, or five years or so, we began mentoring a couple of couples who had attended retreats to lead those retreats. And so now they do. So there's a couple outside San Antonio that leads respite retreat on the river. And there's a couple in Louisiana that lead respite retreat at the beach. And people can go to my website and find out about those. And so they regularly have those retreats. And the retreats, you know, are eight to 10, 11 couples that come together and they hear other people tell their stories and discover they're not crazy Hmm. for what they're feeling and thinking and struggling through. And uh, yeah, so we're really grateful to have been used by that. So how did you get from, from there to just deciding to write and speak and what was the pathway? I'm not sure it was all that direct. <laughs> <laughs> being invited to write and being invited to speak and sensing that God was using it. I, I think the most significant factor, Paul, though, is just a desire to learn myself. Mm. Uh, I and I could I can say this as of today. I still have so much to learn. I mean, that is. That is the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It is simple enough for a child to understand. Jesus loves me, this I know. (laughs) And it is as deep and rich for the most intelligent scholar to not be able to uh, plumb the depths of the riches and wisdom of God that are contained in the Scriptures. Sorry, I I think that's... uh demonstrated by this experience all of us have of going back to a passage we've yes seen many times and thinking i never saw that before oh my goodness <laughs> it's just that the levels of the spirit yes. of god's illumination of his word in our, in our lives and it's it's just there are waters that are just so mm-hmm. deep you're just never going to hit the bottom yeah, my, and, and really that represents what my second book was. Tyndale came and they said, would you write a daily devotional for people who are hurting or grieving? And really what that book represents, which I probably still get more mail from than any other book. It's called The One-Year Book of Hope. I, I was honestly, I was working my way through all of the scriptures that I thought I understood. But now I was seeing in a whole mm. new light mm. after going through this experience of loss mm. and seeking to understand them in a far deeper way and to understand their import for someone who is suffering or grieving. And so, yeah, I often think that people look at books and they think, okay, so somebody became an expert on something and then they wrote about it. And I I would say most of my books, I have figured out something that I don't know or, or I want to know more about. And I figure there are probably other people like me and so I'm going to I'm going to dig in and try to figure it out, and then share it with some people to learn it along with me. Well, that's me. I I, I say all the time. I I don't think I've ever written as an expert. I write as a student. I, I'm on the journey myself, and I think there are things by God's grace that I've bumped into that may help somebody else. And so I write. Yeah. Uh, and. Um. Yeah, I, I was thinking as you were you were talking about the story of hope. I did a shoot with Grief Share. There is nothing that I hear about more than that. Every place I go, I just Me got the, too. I got the opportunity <laughs> to preach a couple Sundays ago, and someone grabbed me and said, "Talk Thank about you for Grief Share." Right? Yeah, and here's what they then they say. Grief share saved my life. Yeah. Right? Don't yeah. you hear that? Yeah. And here's what David and I hear most often about grief share. They come up to us, and David and I are the hosts, as you know, on the on the grief share video series. And <laughs> you're gonna love this. So they they um, you know, they they thank us for it, and then they say, and man, we love that Paul trip. <laughs> that that that's the second most thing. We hear it saved my life. We hear thank you, then we hear, and man, we love that Paul trip. I had no idea. I mean, it's it, and it's not just in the United States. It's I'm, yeah. I'm in South Africa, and some grabs me. And, and you know why it is? It's because he, this is where sound biblical truth meets them in the places of their greatest desperation and pain. Hmm. 
You and I probably say some things on those videos that they've heard before, but they weren't in that place where they were so desperate to hear those truths uh, of God's word. And uh, yeah. Well, you just said something profound that I just, I just want to speak to. God, in the goodness of his grace, brings us to moments of desperation so we're able to hear and understand the best message that could ever be communicated. We just have to get in the place where we're so hungry and so desperate mm -hmm. and so needy mm -hmm. that we now can hear yeah. these these truths. This, and this is why we write books, right? Yeah. Because oftentimes when they get to that place, they think, okay, I'm looking for some, they maybe don't use this word, but I'm looking for some wisdom to navigate this Yeah. and to speak into this. Yeah, that's right. And that's the amazing thing about books, that they go places you and I will never go and they intersect with people we'll never meet. And that's why we want our books to be filled with the Word of God, mm. because we know it's the Word of God that challenges and convicts and changes and transforms and makes dead people alive. So that's a good introduction to a couple of your books that I want us to spend some time discussing, because I think they're both wonderful and important and you are such a good writer oh that's kind of you paul i, I never aimed to be a writer honestly well but i i'm i'm grateful i anybody that i know that's beginning to write i just say just know you won't be him anyway <laughs> there was that person he's gone you'll you never you, you'll, you're not it you may put some really helpful things down on the page, but don't have that. Uh, but I, I think what I mean by that is in ways that are really consumable and um, attractive and approachable, you make Scripture live, and, and particularly the central theme of Scripture, the story of Jesus, live in people's lives in, in ways that aren't disconnected from their lives. I think that's what's so important. Uh, I I do read some wonderful theology, but it's just completely disconnected. And when I read that, I think, I don't think the average person could then make the connections. Mm. There needs to be people out there who just have that gift to connect these majestic truths to moments in life that that all of us live, and you you do that mm -hmm. uh, that very well. And I think also uh, you your writing has uh, it has this power to redefine for people what the Bible is about. I don't mm -hmm. think people know what the Bible is about. Mm -hmm. And what I th do you think they think it's about? I think it's a lot of people, it's just a collection of stories mm. that are interesting and wish I could be like this person. Yeah. And the best of those stories is Jesus. And mm -hmm. we. Maybe we, a mix we, of, of stories and commands. Yeah, that's right. Uh, some people, it's just a book of, of wisdom statements. It's mm -hmm. sort of Christian Confucianism. Mm -hmm. I think. Other people, it's the place where you find systematic theology, and mm -hmm. none of those things does justice do justice to what the Bible is actually about. Mm -hmm. And so, I think your whatever your intention is in writing, you you are teaching people this is what the Bible is mm -hmm. about, and this is what the Bible is how the Bible is meant to function in mm -hmm. in your life. So, uh, let's talk about uh, saints and scoundrels. This book is worth buying just for the, the name. <laughs> I love that name. <laughs> Saints and Scoundrels mm. in the Story of Jesus. Mm. Let's let's start by uh, talking about why that title. Yeah. Well, you know, Paul, the way this came about was I realized, uh, I think a lot of my understandings of some of those characters in the Gospels are stuck on the flannel graph board in my... <laughs> Childhood well, just, Sunday school room. You just brought back all kinds of memories. Right? 
I mean, and, and, and I thought to myself, maybe my childhood understanding of what those stories were about, maybe those people were actually a little bit more complex than that. <laughs> be, be, before you, you, you answer my question, the memory you gave me is one of the places where I saw my Sunday school teacher ap- absolutely lose it was she couldn't get the characters to stay on the floor. Oh, they man. kept falling to the floor. <laughs> and she just finally was just <laughs> screaming. No, that's what, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I just thought, you know, there's probably maybe there were there maybe there was more going on in some of those stories yeah. than I had carried away from children's Sunday school. And let me just say at this point, boy, am I grateful for children's Sunday school that yeah. I even knew about these characters. Sure. So that's not demeaning to that. It's just as an adult, let me look back at this. And and there were certain people I had a lot of questions about. And you you asked about the title. I mean I think the truth about the title is we discover a lot of these people were not exactly sure which category to put them in, Mm. which would be a reality about you and me, wouldn't it? Yeah, sure. Right? Um, But yeah, you know, I just made a list of people I was really intrigued to understand. And so like the first chapter is on John the Baptist. To me, he's fascinating character. Here's this person who from the womb recognized who Jesus was. And yet in the last days of his life, you know, he's sending his emissaries to say, are you the one Mm. or should we be looking for another? Mm. Um, So to just trace what was going on in his ministry and his understanding and the way he articulated it about who Jesus was, um, to think about the family of Jesus, it's stunning to me that the nuclear family that Jesus grew up with, that they didn't believe him. They, they didn't believe that he was the Christ. That's, mm. I, I think at one and the same time, uh, one time there's a part of me that says, how could they not believe it? They've got a brother who always loves, you know, and, and, it, and is always, always does the right thing. But then there's the part of me who has siblings and I'm like, I totally get it. You know, he's the one who always does the right thing. And yeah. how annoying is that? So, you know, to look at his family and then to see how Jesus in grace appears to his brother James after the resurrection. Uh, and that the gospels we now have, we have two gospels written by siblings of of Jesus, by James and Jude. What a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. And or, or to look at the Pharisees. I mean, we certainly think of them as scoundrels. And so to understand, I just want to say, well, what shaped them? What what drove them? Because, you know, they, they have, we, we kind of, I think, have a evil caricature of them in mind. But what was driving them? And So talk about that. B- yeah. Because uh, I think for every Christian, at some point in your life, you will conclude that these are the evil religious yes. guys and... They become that that ultimate stereotype of that. Right. <clears throat> evil. Evil. I mean, the truth is, if you and I had lived in their day, we would have seen them as the heroes on the scene. Uh, they were the people who in, um, you know, the, the period of time that's not covered in the Bible, it's those 400 years of silence. But during the, that time, the Pharisees were the people when they had when Israel had foreign rule rulers ruling over them who wanted to dismantle Judaism and remove all the marks of the u- uniquenesses of Israel the Pharisees are the people who stood up for that for them to remain a distinct nation and people so that's one reason they were people really looked up to them but as you think about it, you realize what happens with that, that that becomes a, a bit warped, that these marks of Judaism, which are, are, are marks of law keeping, um, morph. And, and what they began to do is take things from the Old Testament scriptures that were commands just for the priests who were going to enter the temple and put those on everyone. And so, you know, if you're really serious, you will do all of these things, you know, the the Sabbath keeping and the ritual washings and, 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 but I suppose their problem is, is, is a problem in 
every age, including our own, which is that our desires for godliness morph into a law keeping, a uh, thinking that we're going to be able to approach God because of following the law perfectly, rather than having a heart that is tender toward God and a ongoing relationship with Him. Yeah, you know, what did, what did Jesus say? He said, you know, uh, what is it? Their their lips they speak of me, but their hearts are far far from me. Which I which I think I mean, what you just said is profound because I think that that migration is in ways present in all of us, at least a clear and present danger for all of us, where uh, you come to Christ, you're just aware of your sin, you're aware of your dependency on Him, you're just uh, the beauty of His forgiving and adopting grace. But that that uh, dependency morphs along the way into this spiritual self-sufficiency and pride in knowing and pride in doing and, and being seen and, and i mean i would confess that's a temptation for me me too uh, me too and uh the self congratulation that's there uh the tendency to take credit for what you could have never earned or produced on your own uh all those temptations are there the uh attitude of condemnation to people who you consider are righteous lessers than than you. I mean, who in the world could honestly say, I'm free of those things? I'm not free of those things. <laughs> no, no. Hypocrisy uh, gets at the heart of it, right? And that, that was Jesus's constant um, accusation or di- let's say diagnosis of the real issue for them, that hypocrisy. And we all... There's a part of all of us that has that hypocrisy, doesn't doesn't don't we? I, I, I tried. I one of the things I've tried to make a, a habit doesn't have to be every day because I sometimes lose my mind, but to pray three prayers and uh, I'm praying them to the Lord, but I'm praying them for myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lord, I'm a man in desperate need of help today. Mm-hmm. I want to remember that that's always going to be true. Uh, I'm I'm never going to be a grace graduate, never. Uh, and then second prayer is I pray that you would send your helpers my way, uh, whether that's a passage of scripture or a song or a person. And then the third prayer is please give me the humility to receive the help when it comes. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I am so afraid of what we're talking about right now in me, because I see the seeds of it in me, and I don't want to be there. I don't want to be this person who, who now congratulates myself for things that only divine grace could produce, and then who is judgmental of others who are not me. Uh, but those temptations are, are there. Mm. Well, the beautiful thing I saw as I looked at the Pharisees, though, was the grace of Jesus at work. And, and can I just say, that was the case for every chapter I wrote. Uh, the beauty and the generosity of the grace of Jesus. Because we see we see this one Pharisee come in the dark of night you know, to come to Jesus. And uh, he's like, okay, you know, I've got, checked a lot of things off the list. <laughs> You know, what else do I need to do? And uh, and Jesus said, you know, you've got to be born again. What are you talking about? Hmm. And of course, this is, isn't something he can do. It's, it's something that must happen to him, that by f- he would reach out to Jesus in faith. And when he does be made new on the inside, receive a new birth. But the beautiful thing about that story is that in the Gospels, you know, it ends, he leaves, and we might think, well, that's the end of that. He's totally rejected the Gospel. But then in the Gospel of John, we Jesus has died. He is hanging on the cross. And there are 
two guys, I mean, all the disciples have fled. Yeah. And these two guys show up at the cross, this Joseph of Arimathea who's got this tomb and by golly, Nicodemus. <laughs> and I love so the detail. Beautiful. I love the details. It says they're bringing 75 pounds of spices. Now, what that makes me think about, that makes me think about, I'm sure this has happened to you. You filled up a suitcase and you take it to the airport. You're just hoping you're under that 50 pound mark. Hasn't that happened to you? And they put it on the scales and you hold your breath. You know, am I going to have to pitch something out? I mean, think about how heavy a suitcase is with 50 pounds. These two wealthy powerful men they're headed to the cross they get there and there is jesus bloodied Hmm. he's been spit on he's been hanging there and i just picture them pulling out those nails from his hands and his feet and that they quite literally embrace him To take him off of the cross Mm. and to wrap him in the best linen they can find and to lay him in this tomb that's never been used, which would have been very unusual in that time. So what grace of Jesus. Here's this Pharisee who for a while has resisted Jesus, and yet in his death, he has quite literally embraced him. Uh, It's it's. what it does, it gives hopes, hope to hypocrites <laughs> yeah, and you know, hope to religious people. And one of the things that happens with beautiful biblical language is it gets tossed around so much it becomes cl- cliche and then there's a hesitation to use it. And I think what Jesus says to Nicodemus, those words, you must be born again, are so significant and important because I can't say to myself, I'm going to born myself again. Can't be done. Can't be done. It's such an important way of talking about new life in Christ. Mm-hmm. And we we kind of lose the, the significance of that phrase. I, I always think about this. I can't born myself again. A miracle has to happen. Something yeah. outside of me has to work a miracle in the interior of my life for me to have any hope beyond this life. And you get the the impossibility of those words in Nicodemus's reaction. Like, what, what are you talking about? I can't crawl back in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, the other thing I thought as you were talking is, uh, Timothy says, Paul says to Timothy, that all scripture is profitable. And... So there's no wasted material in the Word of God. I, I, I want to just say to people, pay attention to the details. Mm-hmm. The details are important. Uh, and you do, you do real well, a, a good job mm-hmm. of reminding us of the details. I mean, just what you've just told us about these rich men doing mm-hmm. what they're they're doing is just so unlikely mm. and so unthinkable. I mean, it's unthinkable that they even want to be publicly associated with, with Jesus at this point. I know. Yeah, I, I, I loved looking at the scoundrels of Scripture. You know, I did a chapter on the two criminals who died alongside Jesus and Barabbas, who I think is a fascinating so character. So talk to us about those. Yeah, like so Barabbas... Um, you know, he's the first person who could say, Jesus died in my place. Yeah, he is. Now, aren't we glad he wasn't the last? Yeah. And, of course, we don't know what happened to him. But I, I, I just have to wonder, Did he, he knows that that cross had been prepared for him. Hmm. And he probably knew those two other criminals. You know, they were probably a band of three and, and a, a, a part of a larger band. But did he make his way? To Calvary and see Jesus there? And did did he recognize that Jesus had died in his place? Did he see the way that Jesus died, the way that centurion did? And did it do a work of grace in his heart? We don't really know. We know there was one thief there who 
ridiculed and died hard-hearted with no hope for eternity. But aren't we glad, aren't we grateful for this story of this other thief? And I would have to call, I, I think they were really like terrorists. You know, mm. they, they stole to fund their terrorism against the rule of Rome. That's why they're being crucified. And um, but, but but he's there and, and, he, and he looks to Jesus and somehow, I mean, this has to be a work of grace. Somehow he knows that Jesus is a king with a kingdom. Why would he think that in that moment? Hmm. It looks like he's been crushed by the true kingdom, hmm. by the kingdom of Rome. But instead, um, he asks Jesus, you know, will you will you give me a place there? Could I could I be could I get in on that? Hmm. And Jesus says, Today you will be with me in paradise. And the story of that scoundrel, I think, is really important for us because one thing, one very important thing it shows us, if we are ever tempted to think that it's going to be up to accumulating some good works to get in on God's graces and to be able to enter into his presence, he had no time for that. There was only time for one, and I'll put it in air quotes, work. And that was to put all of his hopes, place all of his hopes for his life and in his death on Jesus. And it was enough. So that his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he is was that day and continues to be in the presence of Christ. That's really good news. Yeah, I think that moment just decimates any thought of worthiness that somehow, some way, I brought something that makes me acceptable because there's none of that in the mind. It's absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, in human terms, a horrible person, horrible track record, uh, but he places his hope in mm -hmm. Jesus. My favorite story, though, I did in there, I actually finished the book, turned it in, and then I realized... I didn't cover one of the greatest scoundrels as presented such in the New Testament, and that was Zacchaeus. <laughs> so I, I went back and studied Zacchaeus. And, uh, you know, I mean, as soon as you say him, we like, we want to sing the song, right? Yeah. <laughs> because we learned that. Uh, but once again, it was so fascinating to uh, examine him and who he was in a more grown-up way to figure out why was he rejected? What what was the issue at heart? So talk about the role of tax collectors in that culture. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're like turncoats, right? You know, yeah. they're, they had to be wealthy to start out with because they basically had to purchase the right to collect taxes in a particular region of Rome. Um, but he's a, he's a Jewish person. And so, I mean, he, of course he's hated. And they were actually, you know, they had to give a certain amount of Rome, and Rome looked the other way. They didn't care really how much they charged and therefore kept for himself. And so, you know, but, but here's that he, is, he, he he hears about Jesus. And as I thought about him, I wondered, has he heard, has news gotten to him that what people say about Jesus is he's a friend to tax collectors and sinners. And here's this guy with no friends. And I wonder, he, he, must, he must know that Matthew, who was a fellow tax collector, maybe even underneath him, because actually Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. He's got a bunch of tax collectors underneath him. And has he heard that Matthew has actually just left tax collecting, to follow Jesus. He saw something more valuable, more fulfilling. Well, of And then Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is on his way through town. Well, of course he wants to run and see this Jesus. Maybe he knows that Jesus has gone to people's houses. Maybe, maybe he will have an interaction with Jesus that will transform him. But of course, nobody's going to let him get near the road to see Jesus because they all hate him. He is, he's taken from them. He has extorted them mm. more than 
their their taxes uh, was were required. And so here's this rich, powerful man, and he does something so childlike. <laughs> he climbs up in a tree to see Jesus. And just think about all the people clamoring for Jesus' attention as he walks through Jericho that day. What you know, we can think he's just moseying through town, and he's not. He's looking for someone. Mm. And he looks up into the tree and he sees sees Zacchaeus and he says, Come down, because I'm going to your house. And why? Because Jesus is on a mission of salvation. And he and he goes to his house, and it's, you know, we don't have the whole conversation, but it, it almost feels like everybody's standing around the house because they, it, it's like they hear the conversation, what's being said. And what they hear is the fruit of genuine faith and repentance because mm. Zacchaeus says, you know, everything I've taken that I shouldn't have, he doesn't just say, I'm going to give it back. Now, that'd be big. He doesn't just say, I'm going to give them back double. You know, I'm going to give them back four times what I've taken from them. And when I read that, I thought, you know, Zacchaeus probably has the nicest house in town. Well, if he's going to give a, give back to these people, what he took from them multiplied, he's probably going to have to sell that big house. Hmm. I mean, he, re- repentance is going to mean a dramatic change in his lifestyle. And I, I think that hits us as modern Americans. I'm sure it does. Where we are, right? Like, we, we yeah, I might want to be a little bit sorry, but you know, I, I don't, I don't want to have to like change my lifestyle to live out what God is calling me to. But that's what happens, and then Jesus makes that beautiful pronouncement: salvation has come to this house today, and it's it's so satisfying to read. Mm, mm, what a beautiful story. Uh, Anybody else you want to talk about from the, from the book? <laughs> uh, These are so good. Well, I'll just end with what I ended the book with, which, which is Paul. I mean, like, so if I say I'm going to write a chapter about Paul, then we look at saints and scoundrels, we think we know which category he's going to fit into. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament. But of course, you know, his story begins as being the greatest enemy Um of Christ's mission on earth. I mean, if you and I had lived in those days and said, who do you think is the last person who'll ever become a Christian? Hmm. Saul of Tarsus. I mean, the pictures of him in the book of Acts, it says, I love, I love the vividness of Luke. He says that that Saul is breathing threats and murder. I mean, that's yeah. vivid, isn't yeah, it? Sure is. Like he is the, and you know, so he's like, he's got the papers and he's headed to Damascus and he's going to bring these men and women and children back in chains. And if any of them die along the way, he doesn't care. I mean, that that's the picture of who we have. And he's on his way and in grace the risen, ascended, enthroned Lord Jesus pulls back the veil of heaven so that Saul looks up and sees the risen Lord Jesus. I mean, imagine what a bad moment that was for him. (laughs) Um, Because the whole, everything that drives him is is, is that Jesus is not who he said he was. And, And he says, you know, who, who are you? <laughs> and, you know, it, it's Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? I mean, that's bad news hmm. in many ways for Saul. And that his, but it, what a beautiful picture it is for us that Jesus is so connected to his people that when they are being persecuted, he sees it as them persecuting his very self. Um. So, but 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 I also love it later in what Saul, who is also Paul, writes. He calls himself the worst of sinners. But then he says why he thinks he's been saved. That he'd be an example. Example of what? Basically, he's an example of the power 
and the beauty and the necessity and the sufficiency of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has the power to save anyone. Hmm. The, the last person you think will ever become a Christian, uh, my, Jesus can save that person. My, my favorite part of that story is when God calls Ananias to go to Saul. Yes, he can says, you imagine? He says, seriously? <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. Lord, like, you don't remember who this guy is? He's on his way with chains for me. Yeah. And you want me to go to him? Yeah. Uh, and then I love, it's just so beautiful, God's response. But the Lord says to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. That had to be mind-bending to Ananias as well. How, to, to just Chosen think. Chosen by God. To think that this, this murderous man has been chosen to be this instrument to carry the name of the Lord out, literally around the world. Mind-boggling. Yeah, and for, for Ananias to have to process that, but then also to walk out the door and go. <laughs> Uh, and to lay his hands on him. And I love the first words out of Ananias' mouth in that situation. What first thing he says, he called, he says, brother. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that too. I've written wow, about that. brother. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah. One of the things that, that, that this particular story uh, in Scripture and the fact that it's been recorded and preserved for us is is meant to uh, confront us with is we must not ever view anyone as beyond the reach of God's grace. It is so easy to do that. I do that. I can. I, I, shall I make a list for you right yeah, now? That's that right. if I'm honest, I think yeah. are outside of that. Yeah, and you just to, to put that early part of Saul's life next to. Not only is he going to be redeemed by God's grace, but, but from eternity he's been chosen to be this instrument. I mean, think of how little we would understand about the gospel of Jesus Christ if it weren't for Paul. I wouldn't be in Christ. He, he's the one who brought the gospel to the Gentiles. That's me? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's just... Uh, mm. and. You know, one of the most fascinating things, I told you I write to learn, and uh, you you said that you feel like one of the things I'm able to do in my books is help people understand how to read the Bible. Probably the, one of the most fascinating things to me in studying Paul was to understand what drew what drove that hatred. Hmm. Uh, why, why did he have such hatred? And it's fascinating to learn from his study of the Old Testament scriptures. Yeah. I mean, he... He, he, he knew the Old Testament scriptures, and he knew the law that anybody who is blaspheming, you know, is to be stoned. And he is zealous for his understanding of the Old Testament scriptures and what seems to him to be dismantling them, uh, to go against them. And I think it's important for us to understand that about him. Uh, so, but what he what he has to come to, and what happens on that road to Damascus, is he has to come to an understanding. Oh, Jesus actually fulfilled everything that the Old Testament wrote about, so and let, then he becomes a spokesman for that. Let's talk about that a little bit. What, what, let's think of the Pharisees. What is it about, about the way the Pharisees? understood the Old Testament and all the prophecies of the Messiah and all the promises attached that meant they could have the Messiah right in front of them and not recognize him? That's an important question, isn't it? I think... Because it makes me think, right. are there ways that I read, that I, do that. That yeah. I read the Word of God mm -hmm. and there's things right in front of my face that right. are glories of his character and grace and his way of working out you know, right. you get my question yeah i i think a lot of it is that what the, the way the prophets in particular 
presented the Christ or the Messiah, if we want to call him the way he was going to come. In Old Testament prophecy, you saw a figure who was quite majestic and powerful and was going to establish a kingdom that they thought would, you know, would be immediate. And so from their vantage point, when a Jewish carpenter showed up who, you know, he didn't he didn't come from the right place, he didn't come from the right family, he didn't come from what he wasn't even born in Jerusalem, you know, the center of where they saw God's purposes in the world. And so they couldn't they couldn't put that together. Now, you know, I think what we would say, well, well, let's just say what Jesus said on the road to Emmaus. He said, he said to them, um, was it not necessary hmm. that the Christ should suffer before he was glorified? And then it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained all things concerning himself. So Jesus was saying, you actually should have known. Like yeah. when you read Isaiah 53 and you saw that suffering servant, you should have realized that the that the the Messiah was going to suffer before he was glorified. It's pictured again and again in, in the person of Joseph, hmm. suffering before glory. In Psalm 22, suffering before glory. I mean, we could go on and on, right? They they should have known, but they he somehow focused on the power and the glory. And when they didn't see that in Jesus, they didn't assume that he could have been the one. And when he didn't save them from the rule of Rome, but instead died on a cross, they assumed he could not have been the one we've been looking for. But isn't that what we do with Romans 8.28? We, we expect a material fulfillment of what is a spiritual reality. Yes. We're unwilling to wait for yeah. the glory of God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, their big problem was they didn't recognize that all that the, that picture that the prophets had painted of what the Messiah would be and do was actually going to come in two comings. Hmm. Because he is going to come in that kind of strength and glory. He is going to vanquish his enemies. Now, the, the tricky thing for you and me, we're living in this in-between time. In, in between this time, when he accomplished everything necessary on the cross and in his resurrection and ascension to conquer his enemies. But now he reigns. This is why we need to know the story of the Bible and understand where we are in redemptive history. Now he is seated at the right hand of God. And Satan, in a sense, has been bound. He he had, he's on a leash, a very long leash. And what the Bible tells us, though, is there is a day coming. There's a day when he's going to come like the divine warrior presented him in the book of Isaiah. And he's going to come with the victory as presented in Psalm 22. And, and, and we're going to see him as a ruler like we saw in Joseph's glory following his suffering. But we're in this in-between time, this in-between time where the earth is still groaning and we're still experiencing the impact of the curse. You know, the, Jesus took the curse upon himself in his, his death. He accomplished everything necessary for the whole of creation, for the, for the curse to be removed. But we're in the time it's still a reality, but we live in hope. This is what it means to live in faith, is that we know there's a day when Jesus is coming again. And he's going to crush all of his enemies against his feet. In fact, evil is going to be eradicated for good. He's going to come as the king of kings. And he's going to establish his kingdom. And every knee is going to bow to him. And everything that was pictured in his earthly ministry of miracles in terms of healing and provision... Um, is going to become then the reality that we're going to live in forever. We got tastes and glimpses of it in his earthly ministry, hmm. but it's going to define all of creation and all of reality and all of us in the new creation. 
I love how Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, which we call the resurrection chapter. He's talking about what's going on right now. And he says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign mm -hmm. until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's what's going on right now. This, uh, I, I think often we, we talk about that we serve a risen Savior. That's true. But a risen, ascended king, we've got to, we've got to include that, mm -hmm. who is now reigning. He's presently putting enemies under his feet. And the final enemy is death, and then he delivers the kingdom. The final kingdom. It's just it's just so important to understand that I think masses of believers don't understand that operation is going on right now. You know, Paul, I'd be kind of embarrassed for you to know how far into not only my Christian life, but my writing life, it was till it was really clear to me that Jesus is still in a human body in heaven reigning. Mm. That he... He is, he, he, he's the first, he has the first glorified human body. Now, it won't be the last. He's the first fruits of many to come. Um, but yeah, I, I think in modern evangelicalism, we've kind of lost that whole sense of the sweep of redemptive history to, and, and to understand the significance that Jesus is a glorified resurrected human being and that he reigns in heaven right now it's beautiful uh and i think again yeah, i i think of romans 8 28 it 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 may not be that the good will be that the adulterous husband will confess his sin and return and be the best husband ever but in all things there's this march of good that's happening that cannot be stopped because Jesus reigns. And he wants good for his people. And that good will finally be the new heavens, the new earth. The final tear will be dried. I always think of God actually physically standing before us and moving through the crowd and drying our tears. And good will reign forever and ever and ever. And that's envisioned in that, in that passage. It may not be this momentary good that you long for that to happen. I get why we long for that. Because we have a hunger for redemption. We have a hunger for the new heavens and new earth. We want those, those now. But you can't reduce, reduce those promises down to those material things. Or else you begin to doubt God's goodness and think, these things cannot be true. Look at my life. And that's why the, this, like you said, the, the understanding of what's going on. And this, I think of the Proverbs. Uh, I think uh, the entire redemptive na narrative is embedded in the Proverbs. So let's take the proverb that says a soft answer turns away wrath. It's not actually true that every time I speak quietly, I turn off someone's anger. We wish. <laughs> but that's the march of the kingdom. The meek will inherit the earth. Meek Christ will win. And when I live that way, I'm moving in the same direction as the story. And ultimately, all anger, evil anger will be silenced before the King of Kings. Amen. It's so beautiful. And it drives me crazy that we tend to turn the Proverbs into these mechanical little maxims that just, they don't seem to fit the rest of Scripture when you do that. Instead of, this is the same story being told. Being told again and again throughout the Proverbs in a variety in a variety of ways that we're talking about now, but you don't get that unless you have that big yeah. story in your brain. Well, you know, here's the thing, Paul. This is this is what has driven my ministry, especially over the last five years. In 2019, I launched something called the Biblical Theology Workshop for Women, and over these last four years, I've done 55 of them around the country and around the world, and. Um, what is my aim? So, and in my first session, I tell the story of the Bible from beginning to end. 
which some people say that that was worth coming for because they've yeah. never been able to do that. Um, and and then and we you know they make a diagram of it you know seeing the a diagram of redemptive history from creation to the new creation, and and I I, I share with them one difference it has made for me to understand the storyline of the Bible, and it's so interesting to me how many people want me to repeat it. I, I often say I'll say, if you would ask me for most of my life, what do I think the Christian life is all about? I would say, well, I made a decision for Christ, and then I try really hard to live for Him, and then I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And I'll say, does that sound familiar to anybody? Yes, it does. And, and I say, everything about that's true, but it's so diminished mm. from the greater reality. And the only way I understand the great, greater reality of the Christian life is what it is for me, is to understand it in context of this greater story of that God is, is is working in the world, that we have, you know, the creation and uh, the the rebellion, and then God beginning to work out his plan. What, what plan is he working out? To have a people for himself who are going to dwell in his presence in a purified environment. And that story goes to the death on the cross, his resurrection, his ascension, and then his present reign, as we've been talking about, and then his certain return in which he's going to welcome in the new creation. I said, so that means, if you ask me now, what's the Christian life all about? Maybe I will say something like this. According to Ephesians 1.3, I was chosen in Christ to one day be holy and blameless before him, before the foundations of the world. And when I came into this world, he drew me to himself with gospel promises. And I took hold of them. And I was sealed to Christ by the Holy Spirit through faith. And the Spirit has come to dwell in me and is at work in me throughout the whole of my life to sanctify me. And it's it's a lifelong process. And it's going to go on the whole of my life until the day I die. And that day is going to come. And when that day comes, my soul or spirit is going to go to be with Christ. And my body's going to go into the ground. I'm going to be separated, body and soul. But I'm going to be in the presence of Christ until, until the next big event on the timeline of redemptive history, the return of Christ. And 1 Thessalonians says that when Christ returns, those who have died in Christ are going to come with him. So that's me. He's going to bring me back with him. And he's going to, he's just going to speak, I think, to my body, which has now become dust in the ground. And he's going to take that dust and shape and fashion for me a glorious body like his own. He's going to have a, he, he, right now he's the only one with a glorified resurrection body, but he's going to make one of those for me. And it's going to be a body that's going to be fit for living forever with him on a resurrected, renewed earth. Now that's what the Christian life is all about. Mm, and it is amen. so much of a better story. And, and the biggest thing about it, it's all about who Christ is and what he's done and not who I am and what I've done. My, my sister Lois says she, uh, does I guess you would we'd call counseling seminars around the world? She always begins with laying out the line, really, the, the, the like line. you've got to have that foundation and, and, first. And people always say the same thing. This weekend was worth coming just for that. It's completely changed the way I think about wow. my life as a, as a believer. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think it's one. So I want to I want to make sure we talk about blessed because uh, this this is. I told you last night, I think you have written one of the few very approachable books mm -hmm. on Revelation. Uh, I don't think there is a book in Scripture that terrifies and confuses people mm -hmm. more than Revelation. I think there's probably few books in Scripture that have been mishandled mm -hmm. more than Revelation. and. I know seasoned preachers who hesitate to preach from 
this this book, and you have entitled it "Blessed." Um, I want to I want to make sure I hold it up. Uh, both these books that we're talking about, "Run Out and Get," you'll be glad you did. Uh, why did you call it "Blessed"? Hmm. Well, the main reason is that's the promise of the book. Um, I think when we think about Beatitudes, we think about Jesus's Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. But actually, Revelation has its own set of seven Beatitudes. And by Beatitudes, I mean, blessed are those kind of statements. And so it certainly seems like John has done that on purpose throughout his book. And and I think at its essence, what John is holding out for us in the book of Revelation is what true blessedness is, who and how we get in on it and what it's going to be like, um, which is maybe a very different way of thinking about Revelation mm. than most people have presented. But but it also, you know, here's the last book of the Bible. If we think about the first book of the Bible, um, Genesis 1 and 2, it was all about there was this beautiful atmosphere of blessedness. You know, God is creating things, and it's good, and he's saying it's good, and he's blessing it. And then in Genesis chapter 3, this curse enters into the world because of sin. And really the whole of the Bible in between is the story of a people living in the reality of the curse. Mm. But that's not the way it's going to be forever. Mm. And that is the promise of, of, of the Christian life is there's a way back in to the blessedness that God has always intended for his people. And it's been one for us as Jesus took the curse upon himself. And Revelation shows us how that's going to come about, how he's going to bring us into the blessedness that we have. He's always wanted for his people. So is Revelation about the future, the <laughs> past, the yes. present? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so talk, talk about that. Yes. I mean, it, it's a, we think about the past. It's, uh, we see clearly the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the main texts John is working from as he writes the book of Revelation are Old Testament texts. Mm. He's drawing from Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah and Genesis. And he's showing us what they were clarifying for us in many ways, uh, what they were talking about. Uh, but I, I think, I, I know why you asked the question, because most of us think that the book of Revelation is solely or most significantly about the future. But I think, but let's just stop and think about that. Uh, John wrote this letter to a particular group of people. It says the seven churches in Asia, there in the first century, who are suffering persecution, many of them, some of them aren't suffering. They've actually been compromised a bit. And he has a message that's for them. And yes, it's about the future, but it's just as much or more about the present. It's it's about who they are to be and what they are to do as they await the return of King Jesus. And um, I, I, I think my summary of what the book of Revelation is about is that it is a call to uh, persevere in suffering and to refuse to compromise with the world as we wait for the kingdom of Jesus to come in all of its glorious fullness. Mm. Well, that's about right now, not solely about the future. But then Revelation is also about the future. I think about how many people in this world, you know, they, they so long to know what heaven is like. And the Bible simply doesn't reveal to us very much about the intermediate state, except that we're in the presence of Christ and that it's far better than here. But what I love about Revelation, especially Revelation 21 and 22, is it actually puts some meat on the bones mm of what the environment is going to be like that we are going to live in for all eternity. Now, it's it's told using a lot of symbolism that we have to work through to try to understand, but I'm grateful for it. I mm. mean, it 
It helps to set our hearts on what God intends to do and give and be to his people for all eternity. And we want to know that. If we're people of faith, we're risking everything. We've, we've risked everything That's right. on what God has promised. And it's helpful to have some clarity on what God has promised. And, and Revelation provides that. So uh, you did mention these metaphors and apocalyptic visions. So I'm, I'm bumping across Revelation, and I come across this weird story, this pregnant woman and this great red dragon. I mean, what, what do I do with these things? Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing, do knowing that John is working from the Old Testament, you say, is this anywhere in the Old Testament? Hmm. And and that's going to help to guide you into right understanding. Or you might ask, is this anywhere in the experience and culture of the first audience? And that's going to help us come to a right understanding it is. You know, sadly, what so many teachers have done, they've said, look at today's newspaper or look at today's mm-hmm. um, culture. So this must be about this. So this, and try to make connections. But I think our best first step is to say, where do we, have we, so for example, you know, locusts, right? We hear people try to connect those to very modern day things. Well, better first to go, where were locusts in the Old Testament? Hmm. And we go back to the prophet Joel, and we see what that, what locusts were in that context, which were, uh, God enacting judgment, actually, on uh, his people who had had rejected him. Um, And that's going to guide us into a right understanding Hmm. of some of those things. So you've you've mentioned this, but I I, want to draw this out more. What am I meant to take away from Revelation? So we talked earlier about that all Scripture is profitable, uh, so here I am, you know, let's say I'm a dad, uh, we're struggling with our finances, we have children that are not always obedient, our church isn't, isn't great, extended family, things we have a, we have a bit of a mess, uh, we've just been through this pandemic. Seriously, you want me to study Revelation? Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to be comforted in knowing that there is one seated on the throne who is Lord over the present and the future and is Lord over how the future is going to unfold. And not just in the big picture. That means in the small picture Hmm. in your life. As you struggle with things, you can know that Jesus is seated on the throne and that actually nothing happens in this world apart from his sovereign plan. And you might think, oh, man, do I want to keep dragging my kids to church? There's so much going on. No, you want to set their hearts. You, you want them to be hearing God's word week by week and have their hearts and minds shaped by the scriptures. So they will set their hope not on what this world offers, but on what is to be found by being in Christ? I mean, when you get to those really ugly parts of Revelation, Babylon, Babylon, and you know she's being destroyed, the city is burning, you're like, oh man, why does this even matter? Boy, do you and I need that message. They're saying to that dad, you think keeping to work hard to earn more money and give your kids more stuff, that that's going to be what satisfies? no. Babylon is going to burn. Mm. Uh, Materialism uh, is not going to be what's satisfying you. You know, uh, making more money, it's all going to be burned. And so we hear Christ speaking to that. He says, come away, you know, come come out of her. And so where does he tell us to go from Babylon? No, you want to make your home in the New Jerusalem. Mm. The New Jerusalem that's built on foundations and is a city of purity 
and security and life and joy and abundance and satisfaction. And as you are in Christ, you can begin experiencing though that blessedness, those blessings right now, and you can begin to value them and take hold of them as you both are willing to suffer for the gospel and as you refuse to compromise with the world. And you can rest even in the midst of suffering, even in, in the midst of what the challenges are going to be for you, because there will be challenges if you refuse to compromise with the world, because mm. the world has a lot of power. Um, but you can rest easy because your your heart and mind is, is settled on there is a greater king. There's a greater power than that that is threatening my, right, right now. Maybe they're threatening that I'm going to lose my job if I don't wear a pride pin to work today. Right. But you can rest in knowing you will, you will not lose anything in this life, that you will not gain far more in the life to come. Mm. Anything you let go of to take a firmer grip on Christ, you will never regret. Mm. 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 That's beautiful. So I want to say again, uh, Nancy really, in this book, really does make revelation understandable and approachable and just so incredibly encouraging for your life right here right now and uh it's instills in you a, a hope that is the only hope worth living for when you say that i'm afraid that maybe people here think that i make it somehow lightweight or skim along the top of it and it's no. just not true. It's actually getting to the heart of it, right? That is so deeply encouraging. That's right. So I think I think it's great you said that. I mean, you really dig in, which is wonderful. It's what what makes this this book work. So what's next? <laughs> you want me to tell it like out in public? Uh, I'm working on a follow up to Blessed uh, right now, and it's going to be called Saved experiencing the promise of the book of Acts. I think it's another neglected book, actually, because yeah. it's a very big book. Yeah. And maybe it's a book where, we, similarly, we think there's not a lot of personal application. I'm finding there is. I mean, I've gone into it not being quite sure about that, quite honestly. And I'm at least I'm finding for myself there is. And it, it is a book just as blessed, you know, the, uh, the hold, help, holds out this promise. Uh, blessed are those... Revelation began with, blessed are those who read this book, those who hear and keep what is written in it. Um, the book of Acts has an important promise for us to take hold of. Hmm. It's a beautiful, stunning, wonderful promise, Paul. Well, what's It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't get much better than that. I don't think so. Yeah, you know, uh, maybe the experience of many people is by the time we're done with the Gospels, we're just ready for the epistles, and then we hit Acts. Maybe that's it. And don't know what to do with it. Hmm. So hmm. I think it's wonderful that you're writing that. I'm, I will, I will look forward to that. Well, thank you very much. This has been an awesome conversation. I'm so enthused by what you're doing, and I want to say again. Uh, Get Saints and Scoundrels, you need this book. And blessed, too. Uh, it would be such a shame if Revelation is the place in the Bible where you just don't read because you're afraid of it. And uh, Nancy's not going to turn that into fluff for you. You're going you're gonna to dig with her, but it's worth it. And you'll be so glad that you did that. And I think you will... Having read that book, you'll go back to Revelation again and again. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for having me. And thank you for all those who listen and, and watchers. It's been a joy to be with you. Thank you.